today's class is on paranasal sinus imaging. I hope you guys have seen the recorded uh, class on uh, temporal bone. Two very, very important topics we've covered in two days. Uh, but I think one of the uh, most difficult topics that, that we face as, as uh, uh, residents, both in fact, temporal and PNS are very, very uh, difficult uh, initially. Once you get the hang of it, once you see more cases, then it's something which is pretty simple, you know, uh, because not a lot of diagnostic dilemma there. It's the anatomy, which is very tricky. So once you know the anatomy, the pathologies there are pretty simple. So that's the aim uh, that you get oriented it is overloaded in one class yeah you see it again no so basically you have made it more concise uh, so that you can revise it again and everything is there in one place you know so initially you will find it a bit overwhelming once you see a, a few more cases once you get the hang of it will be okay what I'll do is I'll share two links with you, which are Radiopedia links where they have very nicely put stack of images and they've annotated it also, you know, so you can go through it if you find it uh, challenging. But what I will advise is rather than seeing those annotated images, just understand stepwise how I've explained and then just see your scan and try teaching it to somebody. Both PNS also is pretty challenging because there's so many anatomical variants um, and, and so many that, that variations are a rule and not the exception here that when you don't see a variant it, it's very weird in paranasal sinus you know so that's how it's different uh, so we got to know about uh, a lot of those and they are clinically very very important because your ENT surgeon is going to do FES and they're going to rely completely on your report of the variants you know so if you miss something there can be interoperative complications and then the, the blame comes on you and nobody else you know so so that way this reporting is very very important uh, and significant clinically as well so the format will remain the same first i'm gonna teach you um what we need to look at where we need to look at and then we'll run through a stack of images and we'll see how to read a scan of paranasal sinus okay so um stay with me uh things might seem a bit tough but it'll all come together eventually okay so uh, predominantly, I'll talk about the CT anatomy, pre-FES reporting, what are the things we need to look at. I hope you know what FES is. FES is functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So that is what is now the norm for any procedure in paranasal sinus. So uh, that is what we will be focusing upon. And uh, some pathologies and how to approach the pathology is what I shall be discussing. X-rays, we will discuss. See, nowadays, you will not do X-ray paranasal sinus. And, and even if you do a water's view, that's hardly going to make any difference. Ultimately, the patient is going to undergo HRCT, you know. So that is what is very, very important. In one film reading, rather than diacom, uh, diacom in abdomen and thorax can be taken. What? What to pass now? You are saying that still, still films can be taken. But in the exam, they will ask, paranasal sinus x-ray? No, no, no. Paranasal and temporal, both of them will not be exam cases. You know, very rarely will you see them as exam cases. They're more important for your day-to-day -day reporting. You know, water's view, Caldwell's view, Have you? do they do that in your department? You know, I have not seen a single x-ray of paranasal sinus being done that gives you no information the, just the opacity that you know there is maxillary sinusitis is not going to solve any purpose you know so that's something even if you do it's very simple there is not much of a challenge the challenge real challenge is in interpretation of the ct right so that's what we have to focus upon all right so so let's begin and then we will uh, take it up from there so appropriateness of uh, imaging, just to tell you what indication, what is the investigation which is preferred. And you'll see again that X-ray figures nowhere here. It's either CT or MR that we have to choose from. So most common indication of performing PNS is going to be as a preface uh, study, you know, which acts as a roadmap for the ENT surgeon, tells them about the potential variants and the complications. And it may also be done post fes you know, if they're suspecting recurrence or complications. And here it is HRCT, which is a non-contrast CT of the PNS, which is the mainstay. 
whenever we are suspecting complicated sinusitis like a fungal sinusitis which may be allergic slash invasive in that case we need to do a cect pns because there may be soft tissue inflammation there may be soft tissue abscesses plus minus mri also would be done because mri will better characterize the involvement of the soft tissue whether there is any intracranial extension and we'll discuss more on that csf leak either you go ahead and do a hrc cisternography which is an invasive procedure where you'll have a lumbar puncture put contrast keep the patient in a prone position and then acquire a ct what is preferred in practice is an mr cisternography which is a 3d cis or a space sequence that you take which is non invasive so mr cisterno is what is more commonly done in practice and this is in you know high volume trauma centers if you are working you would do this otherwise in a routine hospital setting we hardly do uh, csf leak cases for neoplasm the investigation of choice is indeed an mri and you will follow it up with an hrct pns which could be a non contrast because primarily it will be a contrast enhanced mri here the hrct pns is mainly for the bone involvement all right so this is the appropriateness criteria according to acr depending on different investigations what will you do so just summarized it in the form of this table so let's talk about how we do the ct very similar to how we acquire a temporal bone as discussed so again where we take injections was we want 3d recons to be you know volumetric and good recon so we are going to take thin section scans which are going to have again a pitch of either one or less than one so we want good volumetric studies because our main plane of evaluation here is going to be coronal right so you can't have thick sections or a high pitch here we do have same bone algorithms which we are going to take at a sharp kernel so high resolution recons and you may also take soft tissue and bone recons if there is a pathology of the soft tissue right so these are your high resolution bone window images now where to choose ct where to choose mri so this is very very useful and this rule applies for all head and neck you know skull base ho kuch bhi head and neck mein where ct is better where mri is better you need to have an idea and you will be getting these questions back and forth in all of your vivas of head and neck okay so ct is definitely better for anatomical variance and that's why for preface imaging that's what we rely on anything bone you guys know this so we want to see whether there's bone erosion remodeling or sclerosis intra orbital extension particularly the anterior aspect of the orbit ct scores over mri and why ct also gives you a diagnostic advantage is whenever you see something hyperdense in the sinuses it is usually benign because it is one of the three things which represent either secretions or fungal hyphae or blood and all of these mean good for the patient that there is not going to be a malignant pathology it is likely a benign pathology so whenever you see hyperdensity it's good news for the patient that likely it is an allergic fungal sinusitis right so this is how ct scores so predominantly bone involvement intra orbital involvement ct is better for mri the protocol will be a t1 t2 fat sat always remember that we take fat sat images here uh, in paranasal sinus because a lot of soft tissues there and to see soft tissue involvement fat sat images will be uh, useful post gat fat sat t1 and here you will also subtract because there can be t1 hyper intensity so these are all planes we do take a diffusion weighted image and if csf leak is suspected as we discussed we'll take a 3d cis or a space which is your mr cisternography so these are the sequences very very important mri obviously scores because of the higher contrast resolution so whenever any soft tissue involvement is suspected extra sinus involvement mris are go to so extra intracranial extension perineural invasion skull base cavernous sinus mri is what we are going to do and something very useful is secretions versus soft tissue we need to know this have you guys asked this question they used to ask this question to us all of the time that is the signal intensity with different amount of protein content of the secretions so you need to remember that sinuses yeah in the sinuses 
the secretions can have increasing amount of protein intake. Less than 10%, it is going to be T2 hyperintense. 20 to 25%, T1 and T2 hyperintense. More than 25, T1 hyperintense. What I'm trying to point at, it's a general conception for all of us that anything which is rich in protein is T1 hyperintense, Anna, which is true. But if it is less than 10%, then it's going to be T1 hypointense. That's the first learning point. Ki utna bhi protein nahi hai ki T1 hyperintense bana. So either it is less than 10%, but still I'll be able to pick it up because the pathology is going to be T2 hyperintense, you know, something like this. And I will see that, okay, there is secretions here. The real problem is when it has too much, it is a very, very protein rich uh, secretion. Now look at what happens. It is black on both means I will think it is air. How do I distinguish this from air? So this is what is very, very important that when I see this, I know that the right sphenoid is definitely involved. Yeah. But the left one is going to be hypointense on T1 and T2 both. No audio. No audio only for her. Everybody else can hear. Just type, she needs to connect to audio. No, there is, there's an option which comes every time you log in. She needs to, she or he, please connect. To, I don't know how that will help if I write, please connect to audio. Anyways, so what you have here is uh, T1 hyper intense and then you have this hypo intense on both. So this is where CT correlation helps, right? So that's why always a, a CT will be done for a patient who's undergone a paranasal sinus MRI, right? So that's why here you can see that both of the sinuses are opaque and when it appears as pseudo normal on MRI, it indicates that it is very, very highly rich in protein. So this is a very useful table. Two such tables you need to remember you know there are very little facts we need to memorize memorize for radiology one is the blood that signal intensity at different stages and second is the protein signal intensity at different concentrations these two number tables you need to um, remember right you remember our mnemonic i bleed i die bleed die bleed bleed die die so those two will help you here isme bas itna yaad rakhna hai that less than 28% i mean more than 28% it appears as pseudo normal on mri so now let's get to paranasal sinus drainage. Something basic that you all should remember is about the drainage. What drains in the inferior meatus? Quick recap. What drains in the inferior meatus? Does any sinus drain an in inferior meatus? Yes. 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 Yes.